Moving personal testimonies now on BBC Two, telling the cruel and heartbreaking story of the Deaf Holocaust. Since its defeat in the First World War, Germany had experienced debt, poverty, humiliation, and constant political upheaval. It was in this climate, in 1933, that Hitler and the Nazi Party came to power. Thousands of stormtroopers celebrated their party's victory and marched through here through the Brandenburg Gate and on into Berlin. I often read in the newspaper that Hitler had seized power, but I didn't have the slightest idea what this meant. And my mother would say, you'll see, we're going to lose the war. But I would reply, no, I don't think so. And later my mother said, Hitler is doing so well because so many women like him. They follow him, idolising him, shouting, Heil Hitler, Heil Hitler. I was a little child at the time when it started. I was seven years old. I was only little and I didn't yet understand what was going on. I saw the parades, I saw Hitler, and I thought that all this was fine. We went to school, we had a good time, we were cheerful. We were learning and we were happy. We weren't aware that terrible things were going on. They didn't affect us. Our experience was just of normal everyday life. And then the Führer, as Hitler was referred to then, arrived. He was standing in an open-top car, giving the Hitler salute. That's how he went past us, standing in a car. And everyone cheered him, and then he was gone. And we said to one another, We saw him! We were there! And then we went back home. That's what it was like for me. Initially, many deaf people were attracted by Hitler's promises to cut inflation and unemployment and restore national pride. Like everyone else in Germany, they wanted a better life. Thus, within four months of taking power, the Nazi party started to show its true colours. The Jewish deaf community began to disappear. German deaf newspapers were closed down and the deaf associations and clubs were incorporated into one Nazi control group called Regeda, the Reich Union of the Deaf in Germany. It was led by deaf Nazi supporter Fritz Albrecht. Young people 
and even children were indoctrinated with Nazi propaganda. Deaf children too were encouraged from the age of 10 to join the Jungfolk and from the age of 14 the Hitler Youth. I was proud. I was glad to be part of it. I was proud to be allowed to wear the uniform. A brown shirt, black three-quarter length trousers, a kerchief round the neck and a badge on the sleeve. There was a badge with a Nazi symbol on it. Yes, I was delighted. Parents were happy that their children were allowed to go to the Hitler Youth Camp, just like the hearing children, but they were being treated the same. Deaf children went camping just like the others, but when you looked at things closely, you realised that they were not being treated equally at all. Hitler came to power in January 1933. It was as early as July that eugenic experts tabled a, prepared and tabled a law for mass sterilization. This law to prevent hereditarily diseased offspring and to eliminate their genes covered a range of um, target groups. These were um, the mentally ill, like uh, schizophrenics was um, the major group, as well as mentally disabled, the so-called feeble-minded. It also targeted uh, deaf people, The sick were supposed to be separated from the healthy. They wanted to get rid of them. They wanted rid of the deaf, too. That was Hitler's dream. The Nazi regime knew that there would be resistance from both within and outside the deaf community to the new sterilization law. To persuade hearing people of the rightness of the new policy, Propaganda films were produced, which showed disabled people in the most dehumanising way, which was meant to shock and appall the audience. Frequently, in Nazi literature, deafness and the associated communication difficulties were correlated with feeble-mindedness and such people were presented as a financial drain on the state. At the sports society meeting, a man was speaking to a large audience. I was told that this was Albrecht's. He talked loudly and spoke about sterilisation, discipline and obedience. Some people protested, but were immediately told why obedience was necessary. Albrecht said that it was to ensure genetic health, that it was better for people to be sterilised if deafness runs in the family. People from hearing families could have children. And everyone looked on meekly. Only a few protested.
The public health department sent a letter saying that would have to be sterilised. But my mother just threw it away. We received three letters. My relative said, you and your brother are both deaf mutes, you'll have to be sterilised. It's not that bad. So I had to do as they said and go. Otherwise they would have come to get me. Deaf people, just as other um, target groups for the law, were summoned to attend an examination by a medical officer. He or she would then make a recommendation to an expert panel and as a result of that the person would be summoned for the sterilization operation. The most that the person could do would be to appeal to a sterilization tribunal. We know that these appeals were made and they were very often eloquent and heart-rending but only about 5% of those who appealed were actually let off. Otherwise, the sterilization was compulsory and the police would come to actually cart the person off to be sterilized by the authorities. I came home from school and my mother said to me, go and say hello to the two men. I asked her who they were. She told me they were from the police. I said, why did they come? What do they want? My mother said, wait a minute, I'll explain in a second. Then she said goodbye to the men and they left. My mother said, you have to be sterilised. I asked why. I want to have babies. My mother said, if you don't go, they'll come and get you at school. Wouldn't you prefer to go there with me rather than be taken by the police? I said, I want to go with you. I was crying. At the hospital, they told my mother to leave and I cried and cried. The doctor tried to console me and said, it's not that bad. I was 13 years old, still very young. No need to cry, they consoled me. It'll soon be over. The Nazis planned to sterilise 50,000 people a year. This meant that the sterilisation operation was really conducted on a mass scale and the techniques used were really brutal. It meant that People often had septicemia, um, that operations were done without sufficient anaesthetic. It caused considerable pain. Between 1933 and 1945, it's estimated that some 17,000 deaf people were sterilised. The youngest, only nine years old. But how were they identified? There was no national register of deaf and disabled people in Germany. So how were they identified? The fact is that many were reported to the authorities by the very people who were trusted with their care and with their protection. Their teachers. there on the second floor, that was my classroom. The teachers handed out questionnaires to everyone in the class. They said, this is important, your parents must complete this, it'll be assessed by doctors. Assessed? I didn't know what that meant. I took the questionnaire home and gave it to my parents. My parents looked at it and discussed it, but of course I didn't hear what they were saying. Finally, my father filled in the form and put it in an envelope. I handed it in at school. My teacher collected all the questionnaires and then passed them on to another teacher. Later on, that teacher came in, pointed to certain pupils and said, you and you and you have to see the doctor later. The rest of us didn't have to. All of us had to have our hearing checked at the Charité Hospital. Everyone was examined because of their deafness 
and everything was recorded in minute detail. The examination was to see if we were hereditary deaf or not. That's why we were subjected to medical checks at the hospital. My sister was sterilised while she was still at school. She had to suffer this. She knew what it meant. So did my brother. He also knew. My sister was sad. The head of the school decided who was to be sterilised. I was to be sterilised too. My mother wanted to stop this. She went to the school, but they showed her the law. My mother was powerless. And my mother hit Muller, the head of the school. She hit him. Later, when I was about 13 or 14 years old, that's when, well, one of our classmates was very funny and cheerful. A lively boy, just great. One day he wasn't there. I put my hand up and asked where he was. He went to see the doctor at the hospital. We whispered amongst ourselves, was this an operation, an accident? I suspected he'd been sterilised, but none of us knew. About three weeks later, he came back with his mother, very withdrawn. His mother spoke to the teacher and I waved to him. Hey, what happened? He just shook his head. He was embarrassed. We kept trying to talk to him, but he just shook his head. The teacher said that we should leave him alone, give him time. About four weeks later, he took my hand and in a serious tone said, I've been sterilized, don't tell anyone. It was impossible to resist. The teachers told us what to do. They were in contact with the public health department. We were powerless. If we protested, we were brushed off. What were we to do? We had to go along with it. We had to keep quiet. Many protested, but it didn't get them anywhere. They had the power. We were forced to be obedient. In 1939, the Nazi policy towards disabled people took an even more sinister and horrific turn. With the onset of war and an urgency to economize, Hitler decided to rid Germany of what he called useless eaters, those who made no contribution to society people with mental and physical handicaps. And the first targets were children, including deaf children with additional disabilities. The first target group were children with birth defects and with physical disabilities. These newborn babies were registered and earmarked for murder. The second group were children. Children were asked to be reported who in some ways were mentally or physically disabled. Parents of children with additional mental and physical disabilities were told that their children could have special treatment at hospitals like this one. Parents believed the doctor's promises and willingly handed over their children. Each day at roll call, some of the children will be called out for special treatment, never to be seen again. Some of the children were killed with drugs, others were starved to death. Then their bodies were quickly cremated.
It's estimated that some 1,600 deaf children with additional disabilities were murdered in this way. Their parents will be told that they died of natural causes. Measles, influenza or appendicitis. The next phase of the killing program was targeted at adults who were mentally and physically disabled and were officially regarded as no longer curable. What happened was, was that medical reports were sent to a central adjudication panel. This panel of genetic and psychiatric experts never saw the person um, in the flesh so that they just decided on the basis of a form whether the person should live or die. The whole euthanasia organization was top secret. It involved all sorts of subterfuges. One of these subterfuges was a special patient's transport organization of buses with blacked out windows. These would transport patients to six killing centers in Germany and Austria. This is Hadamar, a killing centre, one of six around Germany at that time. What would happen is that the patients would be brought down here to the basement where they were told to undress. Doctors would carry out a superficial medical examination before telling them they were going to have a shower. Sixty people at a time will be crammed into this chamber. The doctor then left the room, closed the door, and turned a tap on the outside, and the chamber filled with deadly carbon monoxide gas, killing all the patients. When all the occupants were dead, some of the bodies were selected to be brought into here and put onto the dissecting table, where gold teeth were extracted and organs removed for medical research. The corpses were then piled onto a trolley which was pushed along a rail down to the end chamber. Two or three bodies at a time were put into a furnace and cremated. People living in the nearby town could see smoke billowing from the chimney, just like a factory. It had indeed become a killing factory. The Nazi T4 killing program covered all in all 70,243 victims. They were proud of the statistics of death and this mass production that they operated. The 10,000th victim was celebrated in Hadamar with beer and wine in the gas chamber and the corpse was covered with a Nazi flag and flowers before it was cremated. 
It was all in all a grim production system of conveyor belt death, of racial undesirables, and of course, deaf people would have been among these victims. Even in wartime, the disappearance of so many people could not go unnoticed by the general public. And soon, church leaders and others began to speak out about the killings. Concerned about civilian morale, criticism and the tarnishing of the regime's image, Hitler ordered the killing centres, like this one, to close. But although they were closed, the crematorium equipment was dismantled and the workers and medical staff were shipped east to the concentration camps of Poland. It was through centres like this for disabled people that they had learned the killing techniques that they were later to use to kill millions of Jews gypsies and others. If Hitler had stayed in power, he would have got rid of the lot of us. None of us would still be here. The deaf community would have been eradicated. It was only after the war that I found out that they all ended up in the gas chambers and that we too would have ended up there. The blind, the mentally ill, the physically disabled, deaf mutes, all of them, because he wanted only genetically healthy people. That was his dream. My sister was very sad. She consoled herself with the fact that I had a child. I don't have a child, she often said, and I tried to comfort her. It was the same with my brother. He looked at me and said, I'm glad that you have a child who calls me uncle, and I tried to comfort him too. They were always very proud that I had a child, but I felt awkward. I worried about them. Before she was sterilised, my sister had a sweet nature, but she became very nervous afterwards. But what could I do? She would say, it's terrible not having children. I tried to comfort her. She used to cry a lot. I would ring people's doorbells and ask, may I take your baby for a stroll in its pram? so I'd take them for a stroll and then take them back. They were very well behaved. Whenever I saw the babies, it made me very sad. I wanted to have a child too, but nothing could be done about it. I'm still very sad. <laughs> 